Hi guys, Thomas Henley here from Asperger's Growth, and today we're going to be talking about what autism feels like, and maybe what it feels like to be autistic, which is probably the same thing. Hello everybody! Anxious Aspie here, um, coming here to talk to you about my feelings today. Just kidding. Uh, we're going to be talking today about what does it feel like to be autistic. Now it's, it's, quite, it's quite a big question that probably a lot of people have there on YouTube, probably a lot of videos about it. So this video is going to be a lot more focused on the, the way that autism affects interactions with the world and the feelings and emotions and internal thoughts. Um, rather than specific examples of different types of autism and, and symptoms and traits. You can look at all, all that stuff on the internet, it's widely available. So I'm, I'm gonna, gonna explain autism in ways that probably easier to understand than a lot of information that, that is out there. So that's why I'm doing this video today. Also, if you do want to look at specific examples and reasons for certain symptoms or um, different traits of Aspies and not traits of Aspies and stuff like that. You can check out some of my other videos as well. So if you're looking to look look at that stuff, um, it's, it's there for you to peruse through. It's also very, very important to note that a lot of autistic people don't actually think that they are mentally disabled. Maybe we're disabled in, in some of some ways or forms, but we, we have advantages in other forms as well. Even though there are a lot of negatives that I've highlighted during um, explaining to you what it's like to be autistic and what, what, what the experiences are like. Um, it's, it's worth to know that it will be a lot more negative, but that's not because of the condition or whether it's not a condition or not. Um, it's, it's because of the, the way that the, the world is made and the world is not made for autistic people. And that's why there's a lot of negatives to being autistic. Life changes a lot for everybody as we grow up, learn new experiences and alter our way of thinking about the world. So I'll try my best to explain what it's like to have these experiences as an autistic person uh, through different stages of life, going through like maybe four to eight and then nine, ten and teenage years. I won't be able to do the one where I'm older because I haven't I haven't got there yet and hopefully I will be. <laughs> maybe just look out for the video, it'll be in the, in the next 30, 30, 40 years you'll be able to see it. So the first few years of our life are filled with a lot of complications. But these complications aren't particularly for us. They usually happen to people around us, uh, such as our carers, parents, teachers, friends. They're the ones. They're the ones that have, may may have the problems because we don't generally um, notice them as problems when we're younger. And a lot of the stuff that is a problem, we don't we don't really care that much because. Um, and even if it did affect us, we, we have we're so absorbed in our interests and and ideas and stuff at that age that we we seriously just don't pick up on what's going on around us. We're on a little little bubble in a little uh, little world. Because children don't really have the inbuilt ability to empathize and put themselves in someone other's some other person's shoes in order to feel how they feel, we don't really grasp the concept of um, people think differently to me until we, we reach a, a earlier on stage in our development. And it's not just for autistic people, it's, a, it's for people in general. Like children in general when they they grow up, they expect everybody else is in the same situation as them. And in most cases, a lot of the behaviours and ways of thinking are very similar to the rest of society. But when it comes to autistic kids and people on the, the spectrum, uh, those differences are quite vast, um, especially when we're younger. And we're just not very, very well aware of it. And we, we don't tend to accept that uh, anybody else thinks any differently at that age. And this situation makes it very difficult because it's very hard to control and explain things to a child who has a completely different way of thinking and brain structure to the teacher or the parent. A lot of the issues that arise at this age would only really come from misunderstandings or complications with social interaction. But even if complications do occur be between friends um, about certain social rules and concepts that maybe they don't get, or some lack of logical thinking that 
maybe a neurotypical child doesn't have at that age. Kids forgive and forget generally a lot easier than adults, so these, these things are a lot more superficial and don't really mean much at this age. You can also get very angry, annoyed or emotional about certain situations that occur, generally because we don't understand them very well. Typically these scenarios at that age seem very reasonable and usually have a lot of logical backing, but they fail to include a lot of the behaviours and a lot of the emotions that other people have in the, in the conversation and in, in the situation. And therefore they would assume that because everybody thinks like that and they believe that other people think like them as well and have the same sort of importance as, as them and making a, a small criticism about their favorite thing may seem like a, a really big deal for them which in in reality for most children it wouldn't be that much of a big deal the lack of eye contact the social differences and the social introvertness typically show themselves at the later stages of this age, going on about six, seven, eight, you name it. It depends on the person, really. Also, at this age, we tend to focus a lot on our special interests. <laughs> and it really doesn't matter what else is going along in our life at the, at, at the moment. As long as we're absorbed in our special interests in some way or another, we are, tend to be happy. Um, but we also tend to focus a lot less on everything else and it can be quite frustrating for everybody to communicate with us. It takes a lot longer for us to respond to our own name. Even though we may be listening to somebody when they explain something, um, we haven't developed the social skills to show that we are. So it can be quite frustrating. I've had many special interests um, in my past. I mean, normally for most children you would call it a talent or just an interest, but because it's autism, people call it special interests. And my special interest was, a lot of the time, Pokemon, um, which tend to hop um, from interest to interest, depending on whether I got bored of it quick or something else popped up that was all flashy and cool that I liked. We also tend to gravitate towards things that are very easy to understand and that are actually about people and characters interacting with each other. It can be very easy to get upset about the differences between cartoon, fictional reality, social conversations and real conversations because we, we do have a good grasp on the reasons and ways and the, the large emotional, facial expressions and body language that we can pick up on in those fictional realities that we don't particularly get when we're interacting in real life. With the special interest, we also tend to branch out on a lot of our skills and uh, knowledge about the subject. For example, um, I was very interested in the TV show Yu-Gi-Oh! at one point, which was uh, about a card game. And I wanted to get into the card game, I wanted to play the card game. They, they were bringing out new cards and I was like, ooh, I want these! So I got a few, I collected a few, and I wanted to play with them as well. So. At that time, I was falling behind in my maths and I wasn't able to keep up with the class. I wasn't able to do mental maths as well as the other kids. Um, but through Yu-Gi-Oh, um, I actually taught myself to, I taught myself maths in order to play the, the game and do all the attack points and hit points and defense points and stuff. And I also learned how to read as well because you had to read all the effects and the descriptions on the cards. So. It was a, it was, Yu-Gi-Oh was a very um, useful thing for me when I was younger. Life can be very stressful for on a, an autistic person because of the, the sensory differences um, as well as the social differences. So there can be a lot of stress from many areas of life. There's stimuli and sensory things all around us all the time. And there's people around, all around us all the time. And particularly our parents are always trying to and communicate with us on a, a very, you know, regular basis, which we may not be comfortable with. And that can be a big stressor for us, especially when we're growing up. These special interests are a great escape for those type, type of things. Um, it may seem like we are very much in, absorbed and involved in a certain task, but it does provide quite an efficient way to deal with the um, strong emotions that we get from everyday situations that might not bother the average person. Because of our such diligent involvement in a certain interest or subject, 
and teachers can find it very difficult to teach us um, specifically about things that we're not interested in. Um, we do tend to gravitate towards stuff that we like, which most kids do, um, but probably to a lesser extent than we do. Therefore, a lot of modern day approaches to teaching people with autism is using their special interests to teach them about things about the world and teach them things about school and, and knowledge and things that they need to learn, which is great. Because of the lack of social skills and understanding of situations, there can be a lot of troublemaking at this age. A common misconception about people with autism is that we aren't interested in communicating and getting, being involved with other, other people. And because of the lack of social understanding that we have about things, it can be very easy for us to fall into a state of being a, a class clown or an introvert or any of those kind of different types of people which are, are less common in the, the group of people that are in classrooms. This is because we base our life on logical understanding of things. Um, for somebody, um, they may integrate a lot of different behaviours and, and understand a lot of the hormones and neurotransmitters going on in their brain to do with the feelings and emotions and uh, inbuilt instincts and stuff a lot easier than, than we can. But we need to understand it based on you know, facts and we need to get our head around and spend a lot of time trying to understand things. So in a classroom situation, uh, we may find it the best way to make ourselves happy and make other people happy around us is to misbehave and make everybody laugh and and giggle and just generally just make a mockery of the class for the expense of people's laughter. <laughs> and it does make sense um, logically because why wouldn't it? If you could do something that's very minuscule in order to get a positive response from most most of the humans around you, why wouldn't you do it? Especially when you're a, you're a kid and you don't have as much um, mental capability as you do when you're older. Generally, um, the time that I was growing up, there was there was a big there, there is still a big stigma around stimming, which is the repetitive, maybe abnormal movements that autistics use in order to calm themselves down. And these kind of stimming movements become a lot more prominent as we start to go to school and as we start to get overloaded by a lot of the social and sensory uh, information that we're getting. People, um, especially in my situation, are, are taught to suppress their stims in public, which can be very harmful to us because, you know, how else are we going to deal with it? But rather than acting out and, and causing a muckery, which is silly because stimming is such a, a useful tool that you can use when you were younger. And I, I honestly wish that I had the ability to do it now in public because it's such a useful tool to have. It does improve our quality of life a lot, a lot more. But because of the social implications, the stigma, the associations that people have with, you know, being retarded or being less intelligent or being stupid with um, doing those kind of actions, people, teachers, family, parents, they tend to want us to suppress it a lot more. It is completely um, logical and it makes sense, but it's, it's a lot more of it. It's, it's not a, a problem with the, the parents and the teachers. It's a problem with the way that the world works. At this stage, abstract concepts like sarcasm become very difficult to grab, grab hold on. Grab hold of, even though that is also a saying that doesn't really make sense. Sarcasm, metaphors, similes can be a lot more confusing for us than the average child. Obviously, children have, have a lot of time in order to get used to these things, but these can persist for a lot longer until maybe about 12, 13. And these, these types of behaviors and ways of speaking can be very confusing for us. Things like get a grip or that flew over your head might just literally go over someone's head, but not really literally because literally doesn't mean literally anymore. Literally. <laughs> It's a mosquito. Come here! Urgh. Doesn't look like I'll be getting that one. Uh, don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and if you want to find out more about my videos and know when they're coming out, because YouTube's done a stupid thing and not really any notifications, make sure to click that little bell in the corner of the subscribe button. 
so you know when the juicy content is coming back out because you're smart you're not gonna let the bad google people google it's youtube isn't it